Hello, welcome. It's so great to see everybody. Can you hear me okay? Wave in the back. Yep, good, wonderful. Well, it's, uh, it's terrific to, to have you all here. Thank you for coming out this morning, and it's got a crisp fall day out there today. Hopefully uh, it won't rain on us this afternoon, um, but, uh, but I'm so glad you're able to join us uh, right now. So um, I'm uh, going to just introduce my wonderful panel here with a couple of words about what we're hoping to talk about today. Um, which is one of my very favorite topics, uh, strategic planning. So um, as uh, many of you know, when I came to Williams um, now uh, four years ago, this is the beginning of my fifth year at Williams, um, we launched a strategic planning process, uh, which was really focused on the 10 to 15 year uh, horizon for the for the college. Um, and um, at the time, it felt like a very important thing to do for lots of reasons. Um, and, uh, and we, we engaged in lots of collaborative conversations uh, across the campus, and we had several working groups working really on all aspects of the college life, everything from, of course, academics and curriculars, co-curricular activities, our relationship to the surroundings, um, our commitments to uh, sustainability and to diversity, equity, and inclusion, our uh, financial health, our financial aid, et cetera, et cetera, our alumni, actually. We, had, we really left no part of the college uh, unturned in sort of thinking about what the 10 to 15 year horizon should look like. And then, as often happens, the best laid plans, uh, uh, a global pandemic interrupted the conclusion of that work. But it turns out um, that working on a 10 to 15 year uh, time horizon is a wonderful way to navigate through an immediate crisis because it gave us something to think about and work towards uh, that was in fact hopeful and um, uh, vision that gave us sort of focused vision to move through what was actually sort of day to day a rather trying couple of years um, and uh, and so I'm really proud that the Williams community completed that process we were sort of close to publishing the strategic plan uh, when the pandemic hit we waited it a little um, and then and then released it um, but I'm even prouder actually that uh, that the community then started to enact the plan even amidst all of the um, testing launching of testing sites and mask wearing and remote classes and um, and uh, an anxiety that was really uh, gripping the institution. And so um, it, I'm really here sort of thrilled today to talk about where we are and a plan that was focused um, on uh, some really important uh, issues. And when we looked at the 10 to 15 year horizon, what we were thinking was, or what I was thinking and certainly talking about with everybody was, um, there are things about Williams we're never going to want to change. The core commitments to the liberal arts is central to everything we do. The faculty, student, and now staff, uh, tight relationships around education, mentoring, and learning, experiential learning. These are things that uh, Williams is always going to do. But the context in which Williams does this work changes. Um, and uh, I often say publicly when I'm, I'm talking that you know, I'm a historian, and historians think a lot about change over time and what it takes uh, for institutions to adapt to change uh, and to do so successfully, and when, when does that not happen. Um, and the, and we, historians also, we think a lot about context. What is going on in the world around us? So the world that our students are graduating into is one rich uh, with technolo technological advancements. It's obviously one that is ever more increasingly global um, and that has been an ongoing process that just intensifies with those technological advancements. Um, we're in a moment of tremendous emergent um, social needs around sustainability and climate, um, but also around the destabilizing forces of social inequity. And so how do we position students who are graduating today with that core education that we provide um, to graduate and be successful in that world? And that's really where the plan was focused. And we did so by building on then uh, William's current and historic strengths um, as a way to really ensure excellence into the future. So what are some of those strengths? I hope you could rattle them off, but I'll just name a few. Um, and, and, and of course, it's not all. There's a lot of strengths at Williams. But some of the key ones we were really emphasizing was um, in the arts, uh, which uh, Williams has, as, as you know, a long history, both in the study of the arts and in the performing of the arts um, and in the creating of the arts of, in all forms. 
um, in science and math, um, and here that technologically rich uh, uh, explosion in the surrounding society is a way to, again, how can we build on those strengths to, to make sure we position our students uh, in for that. Um, access and affordability. Williams has been a leader in the space of creating financial aid and bringing uh, diverse students to this campus, no matter uh, what their background and no matter uh, what their resources. Um, and uh, so how could we lean in and build on that history? Learning by doing. When Williams it has been a forerunner in um, experiential learning through the Gaudino program, through winter study. Uh, these were amazing programs when they were um, created in their times, uh, but as the world changes, how could we lean into those strengths and, and make them um, even fresher and richer for the current era? And of course, above all, teaching and learning um, at an intimate scale. This is the core strength of this institution and has to be, in my opinion, at the heart of any strategic plan forever going forward in this institution. I hope this is only the first of many future strategic plans, um, but, uh, but at all uh, of them should be the core of teaching and learning at an intimate scale. So, as I mentioned, since this was launched last uh, year, we made progress on many major initiatives outlined in it. it um, we're not going to talk about all of them today, and um, everything in that plan is a priority, but we're moving them forward at different scales and different speeds, depending on um, what they are, of course. Um, in many cases, the faculty working groups that uh, uh, work, it was actually just, wasn't just faculty, it was faculty, student, and staff uh, working groups um, are now uh, hard at work operationalizing a variety of proposals in the plan um, to propose new academic programs, um, new faculty and staff positions to support curricular and co-curricular uh, initiatives. And these include, uh, for example, um, efforts in uh, data science and technology in the liberal arts uh, and in global studies. These are some of the areas that we really uh, emphasized in that plan. Um, but today we're going to focus on three other pillars of the strategic plan that underpin academic excellence uh, at Williams, and my three uh, wonderful colleagues here um, are here to represent um, that uh, work. So one is going to be uh, on the arts at Williams um, and the new Williams College Museum of Art uh, building project that we've uh, launched, and um, we'll get some updates on that and tell you um, why we're doing that and why it's so important and, uh, and what we're hoping and envisioning there. Uh, secondly, our augmented Davis Center facility and program in support of campus inclusion and dialogue across difference. Uh, this is a core challenge of our times, and the Davis Center and the work of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Williams is um, driving the uh, work forward across the campus, but with partners across the campus um, to forward those efforts. And um, the uh, uh, all grant financial aid policy that we were able to announce last year and initiatives to recruit non-traditional students, including um, military veterans and community college transfers, which we put um, also at the heart of our plan. So um, as you hear from presenters, I hope you'll see not only what's amazing about each of these initiatives, but actually how they interconnect to each other. That, that, that no, no single initiative stands alone. They're, they're interwoven um, throughout all of our work. So we're going to um, have each presenter give us about 10 minutes uh, about the topic they're representing. I'll kick off a question or two at the end, and then I hope you will also ask questions um, on your own. But let me first uh, introduce my, my panelists. So uh, Pam Franks is immediately to my left, and she is the class of 1956 director of the Williams College Museum of Art. Uh, Pan came to Williams in fall of 2018, as I did. We, we walked in the door together. It's one of the very, very, very first things I did was uh, chat with Pam um, when I was still not yet here. Um, from the Yale University Art Gallery, where she was senior deputy director, uh, and she holds her PhD in the history of art from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Far to my left is Letitia Smith Evans Haynes, Williams Class of 1999, and she is Vice President for the Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which includes the Davis Center, uh, as well as the Office of Pathways for Inclusive Excellence. Um, and in her time at Williams, Letitia has prioritized building, supporting, and empowering our diverse college community and ensuring its members thrive as they live and learn um, in the academy and build um, 
and work. And the program she leads creates pathways for scholars that are underrepresented in the academy and builds bridges to social justice partners locally and nationally. Uh, Letitia previously directed the education practice at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and she holds a JD and PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, in the middle is Liz Creighton, also uh, a Williams alumna, Williams class of 2001. Uh, she became Williams' first Dean of Admission and Student Financial Services in 2017. In this role, she is tasked with further strengthening Williams' position as a national leader in both admissions and financial aid work, while breaking new ground in shaping how those two areas collaborate um, to deepen the socioeconomic diversity of our student body. And Liz has been at Williams since 2006 and holds her master's in education from the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Uh, and I was just sharing with her everywhere I go, when I meet people in the admissions and financial aid world, they say something to me like, oh my goodness, Liz Craig. So we have a wonderful uh, panel here of, uh, of representatives of the college, and um, I think we're going to go in the order that I introduced. So Pam, to you. Thank you so much, Maude. It's wonderful to be here. Good morning, everyone. Williams College has such a long-standing and strong commitment to the arts, and especially the visual arts. And I've been working in the museum field now for about 20 years, and I have to say, throughout that time, I've had more colleagues, and importantly, the most innovative, brilliant, and professional colleagues all have a Williams tie. So I knew about Williams' reputation in the arts long before coming here, but I've learned so much over the last four years from, from everyone that I'm working closely with, but also from so many alumni. So thank you so much for that. Um, the, the robust offerings of the art department span history of art and studio art, and the museum, which is now approaching its centennial, has a long history of working with those departments. It's still going strong, it's getting stronger every day, and we also now work entirely across campus with every department. Um, so it's, it's really just such an exciting place to be. The support for the arts and the kind of um, scaffolding around the arts is enhanced greatly by the graduate art program. Williams has the best standalone MA program in art history anywhere. There's about 25 students in that program. They all get involved with the museum. They're really um, uh, forward-looking thinkers and such a resource for us. Um, and of course, our location is critically important. The arts ecosystem in this area could not be more rich. We have neighbor museums of the Clark and Mass Mocha that complement WICMA's collection and program. Also, um, the Performing Arts, Jacob's Pillow, Tanglewood, and of course, the Williamstown Theater Festival. So the ecosystem here is something that we really draw on. Um, all of these opportunities to strengthen the arts going forward feature prominently in the strategic plan, which is wonderful. Um, and, you know, at the heart of it all is uh, this sort of commitment to multidisciplinary learning opportunities. Uh, as I say, the museum has worked with um, departments across campus, and art is such a great place for bringing disciplines and lines of inquiry together. Um, but one of the strategic initiatives that I'm most excited about is a program um, or is a, is a commitment to making this regional arts ecosystem more um, accessible for students. And one of the most vibrant seasons for um, the arts is, of course, summer, a time when historically students have departed campus. And so the museum and also the Williamstown Theater Festival and the theater department here have embarked on summer arts internships for students um, in a pilot way this past summer. Um, so that's a really exciting initiative. And we've placed students at partner institutions around the region for immersive activities while we create these living learning environments. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. I'm delighted that the centerpiece of the strategic plan for the arts is uh, WICMA and a new building for WICMA. Um, the first questions, of course, when you embark on any project of this scale are why and why now. Um, there are some constraints of our current space in Lawrence Hall. It's an amalgamation of six additions over the years. Um, the initial building was uh, the original building for the I mean, the original building for the library for the college, and there have been additions um, 
up until the 1980s. The program has grown, the collection has grown, there's so much interest in collaborating. We've really, um, we're sort of pushing at the, the borders of the current building. And because it was never built as a museum in the first place, it's quite challenging to achieve current museum conditions in this building. So those are factors that we're really thinking about. We do have some wonderful, very specific teaching spaces. We have the Rose Study Classroom, which is a seminar room where you can bring original works of art out for um, students uh, close looking in the context of a class session. And we have Object Lab, which is a curricular hybrid gallery classroom space where faculty members choose works from the collection and install them over the course of the semester, and then the class meets in the space. So typically in a given semester, we'll have eight to 10 different course collaborations in Object Lab. Both the Rose Study Classroom and Object Lab are booked beyond capacity. There's much more interest and excitement about using these resources than we can accommodate in our current space. So these are some of the, the constraints that we're pushing against. Um, but most importantly, there's opportunities, and of course, this is such a great arts community, and the arts are, are the heart and soul of so much of the Williams College education, and the museum has the potential to really be a hub for all of that learning. So some of our goals are to continue, and I should say continue, because we have been a world-class teaching museum for the next century. So as WICMA embarks on its second century, from 2026 forward, we want to, of course, continue the great legacy of, of teaching and learning with art that has been true of this museum um, since its founding. Um, our, it will allow, a new facility will allow for growing collaborations between and among students and faculty. As I say, there's limitless interest in these collaborations. Um, it will allow us to be ever more connected to the vibrant uh, Berkshire's arts community um, and uh, with a more visible and accessible presence. Um, I'm super excited about the potential to highlight both art and nature. Uh, the site that's been identified for the new museum is the site of the former Williams Inn and the um, opportunities for connecting the building to the landscape are, are um, just again, so profound, it's, it's really exciting to think about. At the same time, we wanna be sure this is a green museum. One way that our arts leadership um, work will continue into the next century is by um, uh, forging new ground on what it means for museums to be more sustainable going forward. So we have great partners across the campus in sustainability and museums need this work and the students who come through will learn about being a sustainable museum from this new building, and that's an incredibly important part of our program. And we, there's so much opportunity to build an, a welcoming and inclusive museum that really embraces um, all of our community and provides a place for people to find a sense of belonging through engaging with art. So those are our priorities for this new building. Um, it's really exciting. The current status of the project um, I said this, I mentioned that the site is the site of the former Williams Inn. Uh, that was approved in October of 2019. Last October um, in 2021, the Board of Trustees approved mo moving forward to the design phase. Um, at that point, we embarked on architect selection um, and we, um, through a rigorous process, uh, hired the firm So Eel which is an international firm, but with a very local um, commitment. The founders have a, a residence in Berkshire County, um, but a, a history of working internationally, especially in the arts and education. Um, they're very interested in working collaboratively with us as a community. They're interested in faculty and student voices. They're really a new voice in architecture. Just in 2022, they've won the major awards in architecture. So they've got both the history and they've designed teaching museums, but they have a big future ahead and they're deeply invested in this project as a chance to sort of make their, um, uh, you know, their name known more. Um, so we're in the concept design phase. We're not to um, actually the point of defining spaces or materials. It's about the concept, so it's still fairly abstract. By January, 
we plan to have a concept to be able to put forward that we would then continue to develop over the next couple of years. Um, and we're starting conversations now with alumni, parents, and friends interested in supporting the project. So it's a, a really exciting endeavor already. We've got a lot of, of good work to do in the four months ahead to get to the concept phase and then in the, the years coming forward. And I, I'm so excited about the prospect of building this museum for the museum's next century for Williams. Can, you can hear me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. Uh, again, I'm Leticia, uh, class of 99. Um, and I just, I'll share a bit about the Davis Center and some of the work of our office. So broadly speaking, the Davis Center is um, committed to centering, centering uh, building, supporting, educating, and empowering our diverse community. Um, and our community has become quite, quite diverse across all dimensions, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic status, you name it, um, national origin, religion. So we, at, our, at its core, we really uh, try to have people respectfully engage with each other across difference, across identities, see their identities and cultures celebrated across the campus, uh, recognize that things are always changing so that together we should become lifelong learners. And in terms of the build, Davis Center building project, the Davis Center itself is actually a, like a central hub. It's a welcoming space for everyone on this campus, but particularly those who have, are, um, are from groups that have historically been underrepresented in the academy, whether it's women or those who are from um, lower income families, those who are identify as people of color, that has been a particular space that they have got, moved towards um, and gone to. Uh, we welcome all campus constituents and especially those who are interested in and willing to engage in cultural exchange and appreciation. And it serves as a very deep space for learning around a number of things, and I'll share a few. So I don't know if you all have walked around campus since you've been here, but you've pro if you have, and if you've been near the Science Center, you've probably seen that there is a construction site uh, up right now. And those are the Davis Center buildings. One has already been knocked down, that's Hardy House, if you recall Hardy House. Rice House has been exposed on one side, and part of it has also been demolished. And Jeunesse House is, it's not taken down to the studs completely, but it's definitely being uh, renovated and some pieces are being gutted. Uh, we've gone through, the, gone through that site with hard hats. If anyone is interested in actually looking at it, please let us know and we can try to arrange a tour for you. Um, as a temporary measure, we are currently housed in two sites. One is Bascom, and so I don't, you all are probably familiar with Bascom House, um, Stetson Court, and the other one is uh, Space on Spring Street, 57 Spring, and that houses both the Davis Center and our Office for Pathways for Inclusive Excellence. So we serve in those spaces over two dozen affinity groups, student affinity groups. Some of them are academic affinity groups, like our STEM. Those are students who are interested in the sciences and the STEM plus fields. Uh, those religious groups, racial and ethnic affinity groups, athletic groups. Uh, there's allyship in athletics, for example, which is a new group that has recently formed. Uh, so we, we do that, and we also support a number of students who are engaged in our academic fellowships, and also students who have participated in our science program and social humanities, I mean, humanities and social sciences programs throughout the summer, but also throughout the school years. So there are hundreds of students that participate in those programs that are served throughout the year. So I just want to say a minute about my experience here with what was then called the Multicultural Center. That's what the Davis Center is now uh, called. But as a student here, I definitely spent a lot of time at the Multicultural Center, in particular Jen S. House. I was co-leader of something called SPARC, Students Promoting Awareness, Respecting Community. And we did a lot of work on campus, but actually off campus in the surrounding area uh, at local schools, elementary and the high school uh, at the time, to help students understand that they can they are connected even across difference, and even when they, are, they appear to be different from each other. So when I came back, 
I loved, I loved Williams, I was a teacher, I was a corporate lawyer, I was a civil rights lawyer, um, I had a family, <laughs> a child, and we moved back here uh, when I was offered the opportunity because I really wanted to give back to this community. I was a financial aid student, and I had a wonderful experience at Williams, but part of the reason I did then is because the college recognized when it had room to grow and there were things that had to change. So I came back and assumed this role and one of my first stops, of course, was the Davis Center and I realized that the buildings didn't look that different than they did when I was here as a student, both on the outside, which makes sense, but on the inside, which didn't make that much sense. <laughs> so um, I quickly you know, took my boss over and you know, two of them and then when Maude came, I said this and I said, Maude, can we, she said, Actually, I think you asked me, <laughs> what about the Davis Center? And that was fantastic because we started to think about how we could uh, support this community moving forward and what the community's needs were at the time. So um, when I think about some of the Davis Center today, as I mentioned, we are engaging with people across the institution, like, and if you all remember your time here, but certainly it's the case now, that students are involved in so many things. So a student who's an artist is also an athlete and also a scientist and also wants to be an economist and also wants to do a fellowship here, there, and go, you know, be a JA. So people have access to everything, and we work with all of those constituent groups. It's become a place for reflection. When global and national events or local things happen that are challenging for our community or communities outside of our communities, people actually come together and convene in the Davis Center um, and they just reflect. There's not a lecture, they just have time to be with each other and talk and share what their own lived experiences are and also talk about what, they've, what they're seeing happening to others in our world. Um, we are, we, we have become a local and national resource for furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and that is because people realize that we say we're not per perfect. We ask questions, we look at the data that we have, both quantitative, we collect qualitative data, and we say, here's where we are and we have room to grow. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit more about our work. We have dozens of workshops that we offer for our community and again communities outside of our own and a lot of those are actually led by our students and they're called community engagement fellows they're fantastic they're phenomenal and again they represent the broad diversity of our community in so many different ways they're peer educators which has been very very powerful in our work because they are living in entries or residence halls and actually furthering um, opening opening doors and additional educational opportunities for their peers we uh, mentor and advise all of the affinity groups that I mentioned earlier, and we are creating and sustaining pathways both to and through the academy, particularly for those who are underrepresented in their fields of study or underrepresented in the academy. So we do that both for students and also for faculty. We have several uh, research, we bring together those who are doing research in different areas on the faculty side and help support them. So it might be women in certain STEM fields, for example, or it might be faculty of color in different fields as well. I wanna say again, there are hundreds of students who will participate in those programs throughout the year, um, but over a thousand easily with whom we engage on this campus. So in terms of inclusive learning environments, that's another area that we've tried to really focus on. Soon after I got here, we conducted a study of classroom, on classroom climate from both the student perspectives and the, and the faculty perspective. That was very powerful. It led to our first ever faculty retreat on teaching at Williams Today, where we discussed topics such as micro and macroaggressions in the classroom, perceptions around preparation gaps, and I would say that that, that retreat happened after the school year ended technically, but there are over 70 faculty who stayed here to participate voluntarily in that program. Um, today, we are uh, looking at inclusive, building and sustaining inclusive learning environments. So we hired, thanks to Maude, an associate director for, of the Davis Center for Inclusive Learning Environments. And that position has been very, very helpful. And this fall alone in the last month, we held three workshops for faculty on building and supporting inclusive learning environments. And I would say half of the new faculty um, have participated in those workshops and also have signed up for one-on-one -on -one sessions with our team as a result. The students who we serve and are working with us 
are looking at institutional history. That's something the college has also lifted up. They're actually leading those efforts. They, they have gone over the years, they've, they've gone out and done their own studies and researched using archives, using WICMA, and the resources that we have on campus to pull together the history of Williams and lift it up, and it's been extremely powerful. They too have helped further our connection to the Stockbridge Muncie community, and they work very closely with the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. They are helping um, them on projects around the county and also in New York State, which are their homelands, and it's pretty phenomenal the work that they've done. And that work, again, has been done in partnership with WICMA. Um, if you haven't looked looked at the websites, please do. We'd be happy to share that information with you. Um, in terms of some of the efforts, social justice and racial justice initiatives that we're working on, we have supported dozens of students who have been eager to partner with local and national organizations to further social and racial justice. I will share one example of some compelling work that was done over the last couple of years and continues today. It's students writing actually curriculum, students from different, who are majoring in different areas at the college, writing curriculum for our local schools. And we, the demand for that is so significant. I've got two emails in my box right now asking for help. Um, do you have some students? Do you have some students? We had students leading reading groups, lots of members. There's something called the Society of the Griffins, a men of color group, and many of them were athletes. And they would go down to Pittsfield once a week and host a reading group with high school students. And the demand is still there now for, those, for that type of work. Um, I'm gonna stop in a minute, <laughs> but I just wanna share one more thing, that basically this new space, and I, I hope that you'll all come back and visit it once it's open, is really going to transform how we do this work on our campus and for the members of our surrounding communities. It, it's going to transform how we engage people, how we offer workshops. We will have a space where we can bring people to listen and learn from each other, um, and they won't have to, we won't have to compete for space in Shapiro or Hollander because we don't have enough space to bring 50 people together to talk um, or to convene and to over a meal. And so it's gonna be fantastic and we really, really want to make sure that this is going to be a space where anyone, regardless of their identity, can come in and feel welcome and see themselves reflected in the environment. So that's all I'm gonna say for now. And if you have questions, I look forward to them. Thanks, Letitia. Good morning, everyone. I'll just echo Maude and Pam and Letitia. Thanks for being here today. Um, and I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to talk with you all about some of the work the college is doing in the realm of access and affordability. Um, as Maude mentioned, as, and as I know many of you are already aware, we're just a few months out from what was really a historic announcement for the college about our all-grant financial aid program. And while it was incredibly exciting to uh, be able to announce something that was really providing leadership on a sort of national conversation around college affordability, the All Grant program is remarkably exciting because of the impact it's already having on the students who are inhabiting campus today. Um, in plain terms, just a little bit about what this All Grant initiative means. Um, Going forward, beginning uh, this September, students are no longer required to take out loans or work on campus or during the summer as part of their financial aid award at Williams. So those three components have been replaced by grants, um, dollar for dollar, and those are grants that don't need to be paid back. So that's a little bit about sort of the mechanics of the program, but more importantly, what the All Grant Initiative really does is immediately makes Williams more affordable for every student and family who is a part of this community. Um, and that's especially true for middle income families, a population that we've been um, really emphasizing and focusing on in our work around affordability over the last several years. What the All Grant program also does is uh, creates a dynamic in which every student, no matter whether they receive financial aid or not, or if they do, how much financial aid they receive, can avail themselves of every opportunity that's available here. So I was sitting here listening to Pam and Letitia talking about all this tremendous work that students are engaged in. And at its core, the All Grant program is really about elevating those opportunities for students and making sure we're removing barriers to them 
really engaging with them. Um, that includes things like studying away, um, internships, research fellowships with faculty, leadership positions on campus like uh, the JA, the Community Engagement Fellows that Letitia just spoke about. And I think when many of us think back about our own Williams experiences, certainly what anchored our time here was those relationships with faculty in, in small classrooms where the discussions felt really intense and intimate. But I think it was those experiences, at least for me, outside of the classroom that inform a lot of how I move through the world today, and I'm sure how all of you think about how you serve and lead in your personal and professional lives. And so the All Grant program is just an incredible opportunity um, to make those, those sort of co-curricular experiences even more abundant for the students we have on campus right now. And we hope we'll make Williams an even more attractive option for students who are beginning to think about where they might apply to college. Um, well, the All Grant program was a really sort of historic one for higher education broadly. In many ways, it was a natural progression at Williams of uh, a longstanding commitment to these areas of access and affordability. So um, I had a chance to talk with uh, a few of you in, from classes in the early 60s when I first got here. And many of you might remember back right around 1960 when Williams was one of the first colleges or universities in the country to establish a commitment to need blind admission. So to going out and recruiting the most compelling students, regardless of their family's financial circumstances. That commitment really carried us through for almost a half century until the early 2000s, when we took sort of one step further um, towards a commitment to something we call being need-seeking. And um, what that means is, again, going out and looking for the most compelling students, but not just turning a blind eye to um, whether or not their family might need financial support, but actually proactively making space for students who have achieved extraordinary things despite coming from families that have had fewer resources. And then more recently in 2018, upon Maud's, Maud's arrival and under her leadership, yet another transition to what we call true affordability, which is uh, the idea of going yet another step further to making sure we're thinking intentionally about what is the core experience that we want every student to have and how can we remove as many barriers as possible so that they can really engage in that full experience. Um, Obviously, the All Grant Initiative is sort of a central piece of that commitment to true affordability, but we've been addressing it in other ways as well. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at what we call hidden costs, so things that might not be top of mind when families are thinking about paying for college, but that can ultimately um, preclude students from really engaging in, in um, life going on here. So things like the cost of textbooks, of art supplies, to take classes um, in the art department, the cost of health insurance, which every student has to have. Um, for our students who come from warm weather climates, the cost of things like winter coats and winter boots. Um, Fall came quite early this year, and I've already seen a couple of students walking around in just sweatshirts. And so um, just in the last couple of days, we've talked with lots of students who are trying to figure out how the heck do I dress for a climate like this. Um, and things like getting off campus during winter study and finding opportunities to connect the experiences that they're having in the classroom during the fall and spring semesters to experiential opportunities out in the world. It goes without saying, I hope that our students are still working incredibly hard. When we made this announcement about the All Grant Initiative, one of the questions I got from a lot of people is, or was, you know, doesn't work matter? Isn't it good for students to work? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And so this wasn't about um, devaluing work as a really important part of the college experience. What we found just in these first couple of weeks on campus since All Grant was initiated is that many, in fact, right now, a little more than half of our students continue to work. So it wasn't about taking away um, the importance of work, but rather just giving students more flexibility to think about what work opportunities enhance the other opportunities they have on campus. It's been an ambitious undertaking for sure, and um, it's been possible only because of our confidence in the ongoing philanthropic support 
um, of alumni and families, um, like many of you in the room today. So I just want to thank you for all you've done to put us in a position to make such fast progress on one of these central pillars of the strategic plan in just a few short years. Um, the other thing I just wanted to talk about quickly is uh, a program that Maude mentioned that is really sort of um, an augmentation to our approach to college access, and that's our commitment to expanding the population of non-traditional students on campus. Um, so as Maude mentioned, when we talk about non-traditional students, we're really focusing on students who've had a less typical, sort of less linear path to Williams. So for many, that means they entered the workforce immediately after high school. Um, and for some, that work experience came in the form of military service. For others, it's students who, out of high school, decided to enroll in a community college and are now thinking about transferring to a four-year institution. Right now we have a cohort of, I think it's 36 students exactly on campus, and our hope is to grow that group in incrementally towards a cohort of um, maybe 50 in the years ahead. And one of the things that's just been remarkable to watch unfold as we've um, gotten to know these students over the past several years is just the extent to which they are true students of the liberal arts. I think their experiences before they got to Williams, um, their work out in the real world, has given them this appreciation for um, the kind of interdisciplinary learning, the importance of connecting classroom experience to co-curricular experience that we all know is so, such a central part of the time here. Um, but they've already lived that, and so they have this outsized impact uh, in the classroom when they're talking about those experiences elsewhere and really serving as, as mentors to their more traditionally aged peers who are trying to figure out how to make the most of this place. Um, as I look around the room, I've had the chance to sit with many of you as you've gotten to know this particular group of students. And so um, I hope that will be true for many more of you in the, in the months and years ahead. They are, um, I think, a real shining example of of what we hope Williams students will be. I think I'll leave it there. Um, thanks very much for giving us this time, and I'll turn it back over to Maude. Thank you. So um, I'm going to uh, move into a, a few moments of asking questions. I want to make sure to give you guys room to do that. So um, maybe I won't say very much more here. I just wanted to say uh, quickly, first of all, that I hope that what you see in these um, three initiatives is not just how individually um, important each one of these is, uh, whether we're talking about inspiration inspiring creativity and imagination uh, through the arts programs, um, creating and supporting the needs and ideas of people from a wide range of backgrounds through the intellectual and educational uh, and programmatic support that we offer through the Davis Center or um, the commitment to true affordability uh, and non-traditional students, which uh, promotes opportunity uh, for all, all of our students, no matter uh, what background, to thrive on campus. So I hope you see them as each individually significant, but also how they interweave with each other. Um, and I, you've had some examples uh, already as we uh, talk about how, for example, the all grant initiatives allows students to pursue some of the opportunities Communities that uh, are coming out of the Davis Center or out of Wickman. And that's just one example. I could I could give many more. Uh, the other thing I hope you see um, in this is that the strategic plan. I'm often the face of the strategic plan. I give lots of talks uh, publicly, and I I often talk about these initiatives. But this isn't Maud's plan. It's Williams College plan, and it came from. Um, the, the, the brains and commitments and engagement of amazing uh, uh, people across this campus and um, very strong college leaders and uh, the three women to my left uh, in particular, uh, I'm hope, hoping to hold up today as examples of that amazing community uh, that has co-created uh, this tremendous this tremendous plan. So big thanks to them. Um, I do want to, I, I can kick things off with a question, but we don't have that much time and I want to make sure to give you uh, time to ask questions. So. Um, uh, let me, um, and we have a microphone, so if you just raise your hand, um, uh, uh, there's one down here, um, and I think uh, Layla is going to bring you a microphone, so just hold on one sec, and please use the, the mic because um, uh, it helps, it's down here, uh, it helps allow for um, everyone to hear you. Yeah, there you go, thanks. I'm curious, Liz, uh, since 
transfer students from community colleges are very, very highly motivated uh, and are uh, an entry pathway from uh, very d diverse populations. Why you would arbitrarily cap it at 50? Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. Um, you know, that's our goal for right now. And one of the reasons why we're focusing on that number is, um, I spoke a few minutes ago about the um, extraordinary benefits to having these students on campus. Um, they bring with them a, a different set of challenges that we also um, have to face. Uh, the first is um, just in finding them. So we've really had to uh, sort of revisit our traditional recruitment methods um, and you know doing things like spending time on military installations or at military installations going and traveling around to community college colleges just to start um, making ourselves better known to these populations um, who were really excited to recruit um, so that's required a new investment of resources um, the kinds of support that these students need is quite different from their traditionally aged peers. That's especially true when it comes to housing. So many of these students come to us with spouses or partners. Um, many have children. And so when we're thinking about what it means to provide comprehensive support, we have to think about finding apartments that can accommodate their family units, uh, providing daycare for those hours when they're at classes. Um, and so in a small community like this, those things uh, require sort of a different level of intentionality. Um, and then we're also thinking about the different ways we need to uh, help those students transition to campus. You know, uh, many of them have been away from a traditional classroom setting for many years. The minute they get here and sort of get their feet wet, they're among the most extraordinary students on campus. But there's a transition moment for sure as they um, are getting back in the swing of, uh, of reading and writing in an academic setting. And so um, we're doing work with uh, Letitia's team and thinking about what those transition programs look like. And with folks all around campus to think about what a comprehensive program of support looks like. Hence the focus on 50 right now. But um, you know, as Maud said, there will be future strategic plans and um, it'll be exciting to watch how this particular focus might play out in those. Sure. Yeah, and I, I will just add that while the number may seem small, I believe we had four, four students when I got here from, uh, from this kind of background. So it's in a terms of percentage growth, it's extraordinary. <laughs> uh, there are other questions. Yes, Layla. Good morning. Um, I need to further my education here a little bit. A, uh, a granddaughter of a friend recently uh, came up here and did a tour. And uh, <clears throat> for those of us who haven't kind of entered the 21st century in terms of social mores, uh, maybe you can explain something to me. Um, this gal was asked by her tour guide, what's your pronoun? Now. I don't know how many other people here in the room know how to answer that question in the first place. I do not. And I would like to learn from you today what, the, what appropriate answers might be for that question. And is it an appropriate question? It seems like it's pretty normal these days, and so it probably is appropriate. But help me out. Help us out. You want to take it? <laughs> OK, I'll start. I'll start, and you can jump in. Um, so, uh, welcome, to well, I was, <laughs> today, yeah. welcome to Williams today, but I would say welcome to higher education today and I, even secondary education today uh, as uh, um, the world continues to think about gender identity in a way that wasn't the case when, what, I think you said the 20th century, uh, in, in prior times on college campuses. Um, and one of the ways that um, Williams is uh, seeking to be inclusive, there are lots of ways, is accommodating um, and expanding our understandings along with our students about how they self-identify. So uh, that is uh, increasingly, frankly, driven by students more than by the institution. I rarely am in a room now when I ask students to go around and introduce themselves. I'll say, tell me your name and where you're from and what you're studying. Uh, and then the first student to my left will speak and they'll give me their name and their pronouns and what they're studying and where they're from. And they just do it automatically, whether or not it's, um, uh, it's uh, indicated from 
from me. So a, a lot of that is actually these days coming really more from their generation. As And I'm sure you all, I always know when I look out in groups of uh, different alumni from different generations, I'm sh you assuredly were doing something in the classroom that your parents' generation found odd um, and 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 was, was a change with the times. And I, I, I'm really trying to not make a case for or against, but just the point is change happens. And this is a really big societal shift around questions of how we think about gender. Um, and it's, you know, it's not being driven by Williams, but it's certainly had an effect here. Do you want to add anything, Leticia? Uh, yeah, and just, it's, it's, it's really about respecting how people, as Maud said, um, choose to be identified. So if you're referring to someone, I typically ask people to refer to me by name because I don't want to be confused with anyone else or mixed. If they say she did this or what, I don't want that. <laughs> like Leticia said X um, is what my preference is. But I also think that uh, yeah, there are times that people are not comfortable sharing their pronouns for various re reasons, including their own, their identity. They don't want to share uh, their sexual orientation, their gender identity for whatever reason. So um, we have actually encouraged people to sometimes say, if you'd like, share your pronoun instead of share your pronoun, so. Uh, it looks like there's uh, questions in the back there. This is a question for uh, Ms. Franks. I appreciate your <clears throat> affirming William's deep running in the theater, and that's, that's really true, and I experienced that as we all did. Uh, the question is that I'm puzzled by, uh, I'm in the class of 62, so 50 years before me, Ilya Kazan was here at Williams. And I realized, I've pondered, why does Williams have in the theater such deep, significant roots, like somebody like Ilya Kazan who comes up out of New Rochelle? I assume there was a teacher there in his high school that spotted him. But how does Williams, how do you explain an Ilya Kazan? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing I will say is that the concentration of the arts here really does um, um, sort of fuel and scaffold the development of creativity in a, a wonderful way. Um, and another thing I will say, which is quite different, is the opportunity for partnerships, and, and here I'll highlight a partnership with Liz, to kind of highlight the strengths and um, unique opportunities at Williams to potential applicants by talking about what you could do in the arts if you're interested in the arts is a great way of encouraging uh, future students to look to Williams and to recognize the incredible and unique strength in the arts um, even you know before they're deciding where they're going to apply and make their way here so this summer we did a, um, a panel for prospective applicants uh, focused very specifically on the arts and there were a number of student panelists as well as as um, uh, faculty and staff and it was it was very exciting because you could see the students and their families a sort of eyes opening to what the possibilities might be here um, so i think it's happening from all different directions and i recognize that that is is not answering your direct question but um but i think it's a great one and and i might just add to that actually that um I think the fact that William's strength as the very best generalist liberal arts education in the country really rests on the fact that the kind of education students get here is incredibly hands-on. And so whether it's Stephen Sondheim or Elia Kazan on the one hand, or people who are maybe not quite household names, but, um, but still go on to make tremendous, tremendous impact in the arts, but also in other arenas. A lot of that comes from the interdisciplinary thinking and high touch learning that happens here uh, and, and that nurtures talent. So we bring, starting with Liz and her incredible team, very, let's call it raw talent to campus, but it's young of raw talent. Uh, and what the college then does is mold and shape and provide opportunity to expand and develop and grow that talent in a way that I think is 
extraordinarily distinctive, largely because of the small uh, faculty to student ratio and the way that students can do that experiential hands-on learning with that faculty. And so you take that raw talent, provide opportunity, uh, and, and they, I think the result is explosive. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time, time for a question here. Uh, this is just very personal. I wonder if I might be able to speak to Pamela Franks after this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Done. That was easy. Okay, another question. I think that gives us time for uh, still more. Uh, yes, my question is about uh, experiential le learning, I guess uh, you might call it. But there's a program I read about called, or saw mentioned in the record called EF Ventures. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Um, sure. So EF Ventures is uh, one of the ways that we help get students, uh, first year students, situated um, on campus when they first arrive in late August. So um, some of you may remember the days of, uh, I don't actually know when wolf trips began, but um, some of you may have had uh, children who participated in them. Um, but EF Ventures is sort of an expansion of the first year orientation program. And it's an opportunity to convene students, newly arriving students in small groups and um, give them exposure to different parts of um, both campus and the broader community that we hope will be meaningful parts of their experience here. So um, some of the programs uh, focus on sort of outdoor, engaging with the outdoors through these things called wolf trips. Um, some focus on uh, sustainability efforts in the area, on um, social justice initiatives, on the arts. Um, and so it's just a way to give students a chance to, again, convene with uh, other new students with whom they might share interests um, and start to get to know this place uh, and some of the things that we value as a central part. Thank you. I think we... Oh, we do. Okay, so we have some time for some more questions then. Wonderful. There are a lot of hands. Okay. Uh, I'm, going to give my, I'm going to give my name. My name is uh, Lou Gazzetti. I was a, a graduate of uh, 61, and uh, I came to college. Uh, my parents were, had just arrived from Italy, uh, and uh, I did pretty well in high school. I did very well in high school. But then I made the mistake of focusing on football <laughs> and basketball, okay? But also economics some. And I was accepted by the students who elected me to the, to the board and seven, spent a couple of sessions on, on the board. So I have some views about what the most important thing now I learned is what Williams needs to be is excellence, excellence, excellence. And that's, and that's what, there was a book written by a, a person at uh, Harvard or uh, Yale about the fact that excellence was a great book and, and, I, and I talked to, uh, to Maud about it, uh, that said, excellence is ahead of everything, okay? So I get the concern that we've done, also I was a, a person who was against wasting money, okay? I'm also governmental, I'm afraid of not just government from the standpoint of poli uh, political policies, but from the fact that all governments, effective governments, waste money. And I think that the co college has spent a huge amount of money, excess amount of money, hiring all the people that are doing all the things, or a number of the things, that ex exist because they got the money to do it. And part of which was generated by the facts that people could borrow money and a lot of people bought, spent a lot of money, and now they're paying the piper for not having the ability to pay it off 
and, and they're going to want to try and get, get rid of all that. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'd like to hear some, some views about that. Um, okay, sure. Let me see if I can take a stab at it. So, um, so Williams is very fortunate uh, that it has had um, significant support by alumni and really good management over the years, uh, financial management and um, leadership. Uh, so the college is in a really good position financially relative to its peers, um, and that has allowed the school to invest in its people, which has been actually primarily faculty and um, uh, many of the dedicated staff, but also students. So. Uh, what, mo what most of the Williams budget goes to is supporting the people who live and work here. Uh, and actually the all grant in initiative comes from that instinct as tuitions have gone up over the country and um, moved into uh, sort of economic brackets that don't work for so many Americans. Williams' ability to lean into financial aid has been one of the most extraordinary things the school has been able to do with its resources. Um, so that has been um, really a gift to uh, to me as president, um, and when I um, compare it to what so many of my peers across the country have to struggle with financially as they're uh, sustaining their campuses. Um, I wouldn't agree that uh, that Williams has wasted money. Actually, I think um, one of the things that is uh, fascinating about sitting in a role like this is is how much more everybody wants you to do all the time and so the question is how to make the the hard choices among and between things you can do even when you have a lot of resources and that's why it's been really exciting to be in an institution that's been as committed to supporting people uh, as Williams does so what's notable about Williams, what's really distinctive in terms of um, its uh, range of support is the size of the faculty relative to the student body. That, is, that was a decision. It wasn't a decision that uh, I made. In fact, we haven't grown the faculty since I arrived. But um, several presidents ago, a decision was made to grow the faculty that moved Williams into the seven to one stu student to faculty ratio that we have now. That decision, uh, I mean, it was a choice, but that decision really is what has allowed us to lean into the experiential learning that we do so well here. Uh, in addition, the decision that um, Liz mentioned originally around need-blind admission and really focusing on making the institution accessible meant that we were broadening the kinds of students that came to the college. And as you broaden the kinds of students that came to the college, the kinds of support so that they could be successful uh, needed to expand as well. Um, and that's really where the college has leaned in over the last 50 years. Um, most of the rest of things that we spend money on, which um, which are very visible, things like new building projects that are represented here, are really important to do uh, if you want to continue to, uh, to attract the very best faculty and students. So just to use the example of the Science Center, uh, which we just opened, but again, most of the work being done before I arrived, um, that's how we get the, that's how we get quality faculty who otherwise would go to R1 institutions. They come here because they have amazing facilities, classrooms, um, state-of-the-art laboratories. Uh, if they don't come here, we wouldn't have the best faculty, and then we would no longer be able to attract the very best students, the budding, uh, the f famous and less famous artists and uh, scientists and uh, business people um, who want to come here because they can get the very best faculty. So I would argue that the investments have been careful um, and, uh, and thoughtful, which isn't to say always 100% correct, because of course uh, institutions make mistakes um, over time. But broadly speaking, I think they've been um, pretty, pretty good investments. There's a question back there. Good morning. Uh, I'm Norm Spack, class of the pra, uh, class of '65, a very proud class, and over, always overrepresented in uh, <laughs> in things like this. Um, I'm going to ask about a favorite topic of mine, uh, since some people know I've been involved in the world of transgender. Um, and I assume that uh, Letitia Smith may be the most appropriate person to answer the question. And that is, for those students who self-identify as um, in, in their uh, sexual orientation or in their gender identity, um, to what extent 
Do, does the Davis Center uh, incorporate their perhaps unique needs and challenges? And um, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So um, I, there are multiple parts, things that I can share with you. So first, there are several affinity groups that are under the Minko umbrella that are advised and supported by the Davis Center that are specifically um, for those who identify as members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, so that's one, one way we do that. There's also a gender sexuality resource room that is in the Davis Center so that if people have particular needs, whether they, there's information they'd like to gather or if they'd like to gather together, that, that exists there. Um, in addition, we also, one of the programs that we have that brings faculty together who in turn support students is in, called ERGSI and it's Indi Indigeneities, Race, Gender, Sexuality Initiative. So there's a research component and aspect to that. There, of course, you probably are familiar with the Dively Committee, um, and that committee brings together students, faculty, and staff around those very issues, LGBTQI plus community issues, and there are fellowships associated with that that students might apply for or express interest in. If, for example, they, they are not selected for a Dively Fellowship, we also have social justice grants that we, are, we do give out, the Davis Center and our office gives out as well to students who are interested in conducting research or working in and around the surrounding community on those issues. So those are some of the things that we do. If there are students who have particular needs, let's say a student is transitioning and has needs, the health center will partner with us if they are not aware of the student or if the student doesn't go directly to them. If there are um, actual things that they need, we also, the institution, will support them in making purchases if they cannot afford to do so. Is that helpful? Sure. And we have time for one last. Good morning. Um, I think the panel is really kind of a metaphor for my question, seeing all the female leadership that is now at Williams. <laughs> which is great. I'm a father of three daughters, so that's terrific. But um, what's, what's kind of coming to the forefront is, is women are ascending and males are dropping out. And I was just wondering whether you'd comment on what's going on. Um, so I, I, thank you for asking that question. I was gonna call attention to the fact that there were four women on the stage and decided not to. Um, <laughs> there, uh, so this, so uh, before I answer your question, I will say, um, we are celebrating 50 years of women at Williams this year. Uh, this is, th thank you. So, um, we're, as a result, we're, we're making extra special effort at events to, such as the Bicentennial Medals this year and other events to really foreground women in uh, the work that we're doing. I'm happy to report there are some men doing some good work here. Um, <laughs> and I could have had a panel with some wonderful male colleagues and uh, they are doing just as good work <laughs> and, uh, and equally wonderful. And I'm, I'm sure you'll encounter them at various moments this weekend or at other times. Um, and, uh, and in fact, what's wonderful about the college right now, if you just look at the faculty, at the junior faculty, not the as associate and fulls yet because it takes time, but the junior faculty is about half and half actually now, uh, men and women. So, so in fact, um, finally, uh, and, in, and the alumni body, I gather, by 2050, I believe, will finally be at parity. So that's not even the case yet, just because of the way, uh, obviously, uh, alumni move through uh, the institution in time. So, um, so not everything's at full parity yet, but, but we're heading there. So this might feel overrepresented, actually, but, uh, but that is to say we have a lot of men in all uh, uh, places of the college. Having said that, you raise an important point in higher ed. It, it's actually a little less true at Williams so far, um, which is that um, we we're seeing uh, that um, male high school students, uh, in, and particularly in certain socioeconomic and racial demographics, are trailing behind their female peers. It's a problem in the country. It's a problem that higher ed leaders talk about. Um, uh, it's, uh, we continue to think about um, not just then therefore supporting um, uh, students uh, in the historically underrepresented fields because at a certain point we also have to make sure that everybody's thriving defined broadly and that includes our male students and we definitely uh, have done work for example um, in um, uh, supporting st 
uh, male students of color in subgroups, and there's others I know Letitia could speak about this as well. But I'm really talking about this more at a uh, bird's eye view across the United States at this point. Um, it's something we don't want uh, to um, take our eye off of um, because, in fact, uh, we could, in solving one problem, create new problems. So we want to make sure that uh, we, we uh, are a society that's set up for everybody to thrive. Um, but the good news is here at Williams that there's, that is not yet a problem. <laughs> we have very strong um, uh, representation from, from both sides of that house. Um, I think we're out of time now. Is that right? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, see, I do see there are a few other hands here, and, um, but I want to make sure you get to... We're gonna stop uh, now. Yeah, we're going to stop now with questions. Um, first, let's say thank you to the panelists um, for sharing with us today. And, and second, there's one small change in the schedule. Um, the football kickoff has been shifted to 2 p.m. So instead of 1.30, 2 p.m. for kickoff down at Weston Field, the tailgate lunch will still start at 12.30. So food will be available at 12.30 down at Weston Field under the small tent behind the home grandstand where we were last night. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.